Stress, anxiety, and depression are skyrocketing among children and teens. And Cook Children's Healthcare System is on a mission to bring these topics into the light. I'm Winnie King. And I'm Dr. Kristen Perch. If you have kiddos in the room, now is the time to put on those headphones. Some of the topics we'll be discussing will not be suited for young ears. This is Raising Joy. Hello, Kristen. How are you? I'm great, Winnie. How are you? You know, I'm really doing great. I'm doing great as well because I am so excited to talk to our guest today, Dr. Arthi Gandhi. She's here with us. She is the Medical Director of Pain Management at Cook Children's and oversees the Safe and Sound program, which promotes the safe management of pain in kids. Dr. Gandhi, thank you so much and welcome. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much for having me. And we know your passion in uh, preventing addiction and overdose with kids, particularly when it comes to opioids, but our listeners may not know. So tell us what you do at Cook Children's and why you're passionate about safe medication use. So at Cook Children's, I got there about 14 years ago, and the idea was to start a pain program. And, you know, kids and recognizing pain and treating pain is a pretty new field of medicine. Nothing that's really um, that was taught, you know, even when I was a medical student or um, a resident or as I was doing my training or even working as a pediatrician. So the idea was that we really need to be focusing on the fact that kids have pain Mm -hmm. and understanding where that pain comes from, how to manage that pain, how to treat that pain safely and effectively. And the science has changed so much. The medications have changed. There are so many different things that go into treating a child. Um, You know, obviously their parents and how they cope and how they respond. And so over time, we developed a really big program. We integrated some complementary therapies. Um, We used different techniques to address pain. Um, But then we also started seeing that there was a shift in the way that pain medications were being prescribed, like opioids, for example. So there's definitely a role for opioids. They are helpful in treating acute pain. They're helpful in treating pain associated with cancer or with disease, other conditions like that. Um, But we weren't really sure what the long-term implications of those kind of medications are in kids and whether or not it's safe to prescribe them, and then how much do you prescribe them, and for how long. So we started this program about three years ago, looking at safe and sound prescribing habits, and what, how do our doctors prescribe pain medications, and are we prescribing the right amount, are we prescribing too much, are kids becoming addicted to these pain medications, and we discovered that we kind of were, we were prescribing too many pills. Really? Um, and we've seen over the years that kids are becoming addicted to pain medication and they are overdosing and it's not really like, you know, we kind of think of like drug addiction. We think of heroin or we think of like, you know, methamphetamines or things like that, but it's really like they get exposed to these narcotics and to these opioids when they're early adolescents and the way that they're developing that they don't really know how to prevent that addiction from happening. And then it turns into misuse and abuse. And really the overdoses and the addiction are those early adults, but the exposure starts in teenage years or adolescence. Oh, wow. And you want people to be comfortable. You want the kids, especially if they're, they're chronically ill and they have pain and you want them to be careful uh, and you want them to be comfortable, but to do it on an ongoing basis really is something you have to watch. Right. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. You know, if you have surgery, you want them to be comfortable after they have surgery, but there's so many things that go into making someone comfortable after surgery, right? Did they get a heating pad? Did they get an ice pack? Do they have um, something to comfort them? Do they have their favorite blanket? Did we prescribe the right types of medications? So there's just because you have pain, it's not always a narcotic or an opioid that treats pain. What I tell kids is if you have an ear infection, I have to give you an antibiotic for an ear infection. If I gave you an antibiotic for a urinary tract infection, it would do nothing. 
So let's make sure that we're treating the pain that you're having and treat it with the right treatments. Right. What are some of the signs that parents need to be on the lookout for when it comes to opioids? So, you know, opioids, like many other substances, can be habit forming and addictive. And I really think that what we as parents need to really be mindful of is how do we address medication use in general with our kids? How do we model our behavior in front of kids? Right. So <laughs> don't do, do as I say. Don't do as I do. Right. right. Wow. So like, okay. you know, growing up, my mom, anytime I like hurt my elbow or if I had a fever or if my tummy ached or um, anything, she'd be like, oh, you want an Advil? Advil helps everything. Right. Like gotcha. Advil is like the yeah. magical drug. My mother always had a bottle of Advil with her <laughs> wherever we went. She was convinced that she was going to get a headache. And so. I try not to model that in front of my kids, right? Like I'm not constantly saying, okay, here's an Advil or here's a pill. I'm saying, here's an ice pack, go rest, go watch a show here. Let me get you a popsicle. Let's distract. Let's do other things. And that pain will heal. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's a natural course timeline for pain. So just like opioids or any medication, it's really about teaching kids on what is the safe way to take medications? How do you take a medicine when it's indicated, when it's prescribed? So you want to have that education with your kids Mm -hmm. about the safe use of medicines, the safe storage of medicines, and the safe disposal, right? right? Like you don't want them to see that as they're running around in the house and they're playing hide and seek, that when they open up the bathroom cabinet, because they think they can hide in there, there's like a whole pill box, right? right? Like, why are we, why are the kids seeing these pills everywhere they go? Right. And so then they start to think, well, my doctor prescribed Percocet. So, you know, it's, it's okay to take. And I took it and I did fine. Now I'm at a party and my friends have pills. So it was in their cabinet. So I'm going to take it. Because you like put away your detergent, you put away, you know, you put those lot boxes on chemicals yep. because your kids, you want them to stay out of it. Like they have in their heads that you should not get into this. So it should be that same kind of principle of when you're taking a medicine or you're doing something, it's because there's a specific reason for why you're doing that. Right. And so setting up those habits is really important when it comes to any medication, your ADHD medicine, your opioids, because they are indicated. There are times when you need to take them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in mental health treatment, we know it's so important to keep those medications locked up because sometimes kids do use them to try to hurt themselves. And sometimes, you know, that's a very impulsive decision. So you want to be, you know, limit access to those kind of things. So I couldn't agree with you more that putting away those medications that could potentially kill a kid. Mm -hmm. But do keep in mind that there are some that you get over the counter that could be very dangerous and life ending, like Tylenol, for example. So, you know, definitely, because I think some parents think, okay, yeah, I should put the um, blood pressure medicines up. I should put up the Percocet, but, you know, Tylenol, Advil, we can leave that out. But no, no, all of it, lock it up. Exactly. Don't, Don't give a kid access to it. Well, Tylenol ingestions, actually overdoses, are the number one reason for an overdose to the emergency room and is the number one reason for liver transplant Ooh. is Tylenol toxicity. Ooh. Yes. The most commonly prescribed opioids that parents should really be um, on the lookout for include Tylenol with codeine, oxycodone, Percocet, hydrocodone. Those are the most commonly used. And if you need more information about any of these substances or are concerned about um, opioids or any other um, misuse of medications, you can refer to the DEA website or to the Safe and Sound website through Cook Children's or contact your personal physician. So yeah, any medication. So it's that it's just that whole mindset and behavior um, where we are just kind of a pill society. Yeah. We think a pill is going to fix this. We think a pill is going to fix that. But it's not. And you have to really think about the bigger picture. I have found myself terrified 
because of opioids and and the things that I've heard seriously, because I've had some surgeries or some dental procedure. And after that procedure, they send me home with, you know, hydrocodone or whatever it is. And I'm determined I'm going to suffer through this. I'm not going to take it because I'm afraid. I'm seriously afraid of taking it and what might happen if I have to take it over a prolonged period of time. I'm just I'm terrified. So I'm like, yeah, I see you over there on that on that counter, but I'm not touching you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, like we said before, there is an indication. There's a reason. And so you have to have, you know, good communication with your doctor, set expectations before surgery. So that's something else that we've really worked hard on is communicating with the families and setting expectations of what this particular surgery is going to be like, what we prescribe. Um, one of our premises is that we really try to schedule Tylenol and Motrin for 72 hours after surgery together every six hours. And then a narcotic is only if we need to go above and beyond that. But if you have that communication with a family, you collaborate with them on what a pain plan will be, that makes it a lot better. Um, but you have to have, you know, you have to control pain. But I think it's, I think it's when we don't connect the dots for families or patients, you know, like I've been in the adult world sometimes where they will give you three different bottles of pain medicine yeah. after surgery yeah. and everything is, well, just take this as needed Yes, and you can decide how bad your pain is. Yes. And if you have a muscle spasm, take this. Yeah. And if you have more pain, try Tylenol. And if that doesn't work, here's some hydrocodone. And you don't really know because you're not, you know, you, you just yeah. don't know. And yeah. then you just hear all this negative things and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't take this. And sometimes I do have to convince parents, you know, it's okay for your child to have an oxycodone after surgery, but let's do this as your plan. Mm -hmm. Let me talk to you and give you a regimen mm -hmm. so that you know what to do in which circumstance. And then the nurses communicate the same message, but it's going home without a plan, yes. which is the most stressful. Yeah. You know, and I have had recently had, um, a, dental procedure. And before I even go to the back, they've already called in the pain medication before <laughs> I even go back. Yeah. So it's in my, it's at CVS and it's already ready for me when I come out. And I, I could, you know, I really appreciate the convenience, but it's just, it's so cavalier. It's just, uh, whatever, you know, yeah. you're going to need it. We'll order it. Keep going. Right. And just like you said, take it as you feel you need it. Okay. I'm not going to need it. I'm going to try not to need this. <laughs> I know. <'cause laughs> I'm going to try not to need this. <laughs> I don't know what that means. And if I take one, am I going to be like addicted to this for the rest of my life? And then I'm going to lose my job. And this is what, you know, blah, See, blah, okay. blah, blah, blah. You have been in my yeah. head. <laughs> <laughs> so you just go from one thing yes. to the next. Yeah, I but... spiral. <laughs> exactly. So we just have to kind of set up expectations. We have to talk to the families. You have to talk to the kids. I mean, right. there's a time and a place for everything. Um, but just... Be conscious of what you're doing, you know, like just be aware. For sure. Yeah. Dr. Gandhi, have you seen a rise in drug overdoses over the pandemic? So unfortunately, yes. Um, and I think, you know, if you follow the CDC in 2020, there were about 70,000 deaths related to overdose of opioids. And in 2021, there were over 100,000. And, and that's adults and kids. Adults and kids. Okay. And so, you know, tracking the information 2022, we're still seeing kind of a rise. We're not seeing a slowing down in that number. Some of them, um, overdoses are intentional, mm. like a suicide. Mm. Others are unintentional. So we are seeing more counterfeit medications. Mm. So pills that are not made here, that are not FDA approved medications. And if you look at them, they look exactly like the real pill. Mm -hmm. And then those are laced with substances like fentanyl or methamphetamines, and they result in overdose and death. Mm -hmm. Wow. And, and do you think the increase, and I'm, you're probably going to repeat what you just said, but the increase is because people during the pandemic, I, I need to, I, I'm suffering not only, you know, physically, but I'm suffering emotionally and I need to take something that's going to ease the pain. Well, and also isolation and um, some boredom. Mm. 
Mm. And I think with kids, there was a definite increase in suicide. I mean, you know, yeah. you can already, you've already. It's why we're here. Why you're here. <laughs> that's why we right. That's why the joy this. campaign. Yeah, exactly. It's because you saw that mm. and you saw, you know, the impact it was having on children. So that depression and that anxiety and that social isolation. But then also, you know, for adolescents, they're home by themselves. They don't have much supervision. There's boredom. Um, a lot of these substances you can just get online. You can order over Snapchat or Twitter, and it just literally shows up at your doorstep. Mm. And then there's um, pill parties. So kids will take pills out of their parents' cabinets. They'll put them in a bowl, and then they'll show up, and there'll be a bunch of kids, and they'll experiment. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm so glad I don't have teenagers yet. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, the DEA, for example, is having a huge campaign right now called One Pill Can Kill. And right. it's the danger of, you know, you don't know what's in that medication. They seized over 20 million counterfeit tablets this year or last year um, in the United States. And they recovered enough fentanyl in those substances to kill every single American. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's just, it's a common, it's, it's a horrible combination of events. Yeah. Isolation, anxiety, depression. And then the adolescent is very experiment oriented. <laughs> mm -hmm. That is what their whole developmental makeup is, is to experiment is to test the boundaries. They do not have development of their prefrontal cortex. So their <laughs> brain is developing back to front. So this is a true developmental phenomenon. They are pruning. So they are getting rid of information in their brain that they don't need anymore. So they don't need to remember what age they were when they walked. They don't need to remember, you know, the first movie they ever saw. They're getting rid of that. And now they are making room for new memories, but the way their brain is developing, they are basically a car going down a highway at full speed with no brakes. <laughs> they have <laughs> no regulation whatsoever. So we can like lecture kids and adolescents about don't try this, don't try that, don't do this, don't do that. But really it's like we're fighting their biology. We're fighting their physiology. We're fighting their brain development when we are telling them all of these things. But when they're in a situation around peers or friends or peer pressure or questioning or angry at something or they're just impulsive. Yeah. And they just don't know yes. how to control it. Or have the ability to see like your, with your car analogy, like they, they yeah. also don't have the ability to predict the future or how this is right. going to backfire in yeah. 30 minutes when they have to explain it to the mom. Like they exactly. have no ability to think that. And I don't know why I'm so surprised because I was that way with my mother. My mother was well, like, I hope you have one just like that you. is what my mom said. <laughs> so my mom used to like just beg. Oh, sorry, I'm not just to the table. Would just beg that you. um have a daughter that will <laughs> torment you like you tormented me. Yep. And my dad would come home when I was in high school and I would be sitting on the front lawn without the car keys, just literally sitting on the front lawn. And he's like, what are you doing? I'd say she locked me out again <laughs> and she would lock me out of the house. <laughs> be like, just sit here. Just sit here. And my, I would have to wait till my dad got home so I could get back in the house. <laughs> and I would see her looking out the drapes at just three sure in the you... morning <laughs> when I would be sneaking in after being out at some party all night. Uh -oh. Yeah. Mm -mm. So, I did all this stuff. Okay. I, yeah. Okay. So, so for, as a parent, that gives us hope mm -hmm. that even yes. if we have teenagers who are making ridiculous decisions, they, their brain's going to continue to develop maybe yes. when they're like 21, 25 and they can get it together. They can become a medical do doctor, yes. a medical director and <laughs> be passionate yeah, about yeah. their job and be very successful. Yes. But does it take that yes. long? 21, 25 to, for the, yes. for your frontal oh. lobe to fully develop? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's not good. Okay. But that's, why it's, <laughs> that's why as parents, we have to like find good risk taking behaviors. We yeah. have to get them engaged in activities with school. We need to keep them involved in community. We need to not have them socially isolated. Right. We need to have them around peers and school. 
and, you know, healthy environments. That's why they bungee jump, but go on. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Uh, So Dr. Gandhi, tell us about um, your partnership with the DEA and why it's important to you. So um, last year I became a clinical instructor for the DEA with the responsibility of doing presentations around the country Um, around the state. Everything is Zoom right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Talking about um, substance use, medical awareness of prescriptions, you know, prescribing practices, um, diversion um, within medical facilities and pharmacies, uh, because this is a problem that affects everyone. It's not just, you know, one particular group of people, you know, even in the healthcare um, environment, we suffer from substance use and yep. misuse and abuse and overdose yep. um, and diverting drugs that should be meant for someone else. Um, so this is a great opportunity for me to be able to present information, you know, about our own community, things that the medical profession struggles with, with this, um, and then raising awareness to families and communities and to, um, especially with, you know, collaborating with adult institutions as well, knowing that a lot of the guidelines that have been created are around adult medication use. So, What can parents do? I mean, we just talked about the, the riskiness and the risky mm-hmm. behavior of, of children when they're not frontally <laughs> developed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the frontal lobe is not developed, but how can they... Um, how can parents help children avoid overdose, overdosing? Yeah. So, you know, obviously there are school programs that are in place um, that bring about conversations on substance use and misuse and trying to educate our, our youth and our children. Um, modeling those positive behaviors, really being vigilant about the way that you prescribe, the way that you use, the way that you store. And for me, I think one of the most important things is that disposal of medications. So once you're finished with a prescription and you are no longer taking it, you need to get rid of it. There is no reason in the house to store up all the hydrocodone you've ever received over the past 15 years, Yeah. right? Because Five of your pills, 10 of dad's pills, four of brother's pills, and six of sister's pills Mm -hmm. add up to 20 or 30 pills sitting in the house that are just asking for trouble. So that's one of the key things that I would say is to get rid of any unused medication. Something else that's kind of interesting that we've been talking about lately Uh, within our own institution, is naloxone. So naloxone is an opioid antagonist. It's a nasal spray Mm -hmm. that if someone were to overdose from an opioid, you could give one spray in each nostril and reverse it. Mm. It could be life-saving. If the patient or the person, sorry, did not overdose from an opioid and you gave them naloxone, it would not hurt them. Okay. It would not do anything. So this medication is available at any pharmacy. You do not even have to have a prescription oh. to have it. So you could literally go to your pharmacy and say, hey, can I have a naloxone prescription? And they would say, yes, your insurance would cover it. You could take it home and keep it in a cabinet just in case someone got into something somehow that they shouldn't have had. So I think that that's something that the public should be aware of. Sure. I didn't know. I didn't know that, but I feel like I will like that would really help parents for sure, especially Mm -hmm. teenagers. Right. And they're going to those pill parties and something happens and it's in my house and I didn't know it was happening wherever it was happening and people are passing out. I don't know. That's that's good to know. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. I mean, I've thought about it when my kids, you know, I mean, they're still little eight and 11, but they're not really (laughs) (laughs) that little. But, um, you know, in Richland Hills, 
just six months ago, I think, a 12-year-old died in her bedroom oh. from a fentanyl overdose. She had gotten a pill from mm. Snapchat and died. Oh, that's so sad. Yeah. And so, you know, having this potentially life-saving medication could make all the, all the difference. Right. For sure. Well, tell us about the work you're doing at Cook Children's to help kids manage pain without turning immediately to medications. So my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love this aspect. So we have really um, created a lot of different programs. We work closely with Child Life. Um, mm -hmm. You know that the Child Life program at Cook's is amazing. They have so many different services that they're able to provide for our kids, managing pain and fear. We've created something called a comfort menu, which allows us as providers to have a tool so that anytime a child is going to have a procedure done or something that could be painful or fearful for them, it reminds us that we always need to communicate with our families. This is what we're going to do. This is why we're doing it. Do you have any questions? Coming up with a plan with the family. We have options for you know, cold spray, numbing cream, a buzzy device, mom or dad holding, um, things of that nature. If those th tools aren't enough, we have medications or different services or anesthesia for some reason if we needed to. So creating that idea of communicating and collaborating and coming up with a plan with the family. And then we've also incorporated a lot of complementary therapies. So we have a full aromatherapy program. Mm. We have a full massage therapy program with three full-time massage therapists that do massage both inpatient and outpatient. We have studies looking at the benefits of massage for different surgical procedures. We have incorporated virtual reality into our program. So we have studies in place looking at the use of virtual reality when patients are going through painful um, procedures such as port placements or bladder studies that can be uncomfortable. We have um, full acupuncture. So three of the pain positions provide acupuncture services. Wow. Our wow. <laughs> wait, wait, stop. Don't go mm -hmm. past. Okay. Uh, acupuncture. So we're recognizing that that is really something that helps with pain. Absolutely. Huh. Yeah. There have been studies that have looked at functional MRIs to look at the blood flow of the brain during acupuncture. And they see that the areas of the brain that are responsible for pain and pleasure light up showing that acupuncture is beneficial. They've looked at cortisol levels during acupuncture. They've done that compared to placebo or sham acupuncture. And there are some clear indications for its benefit. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, that's good. It's amazing. That's yeah. really good. We use acupuncture in some neonates, like newborn babies. Get out. That have been exposed in utero to drugs or babies that have been in the ICU for prolonged sedation on, you know, morphine or other kinds of medications to keep them comfortable. And we use acupuncture to help them be able to wean off of those medications. Migraine headaches respond really well to acupuncture. Yep. Very good. Constipation, oncology, nausea, and vomiting. So we have a full acupuncture service, wow, which is great. great. And yeah. I feel like, you know, for kids, we really do try to avoid using medications if we don't need to. So I think it's helped us think out of the box about how can we treat pain without necessarily using opioids and things like that. And I hope that some of the research that we have in kids will help inform adults as well about all these other, you know, avenues of treatment. Because I feel like I feel like our pain service is more robust in the complementary strategies than most adult hospitals would be. Yes. Yeah. Um, for sure. I, I, I think everything in the pediatric world, you know, we communicate with our families yeah. <laughs> really well. We come up with plans with them well. We use non-medicine therapies. Um, and so the more that we can study it, the more benefits we can see from it. You know, insurance always is kind of that catch, you mm -hmm. know, that makes it difficult to be able to provide to more people. Fortunately for us, we have a great um, 
foundation and great donations from community partners and families and trusts that have been able to fund many of these um, resources. So it's no cost to our patients wow. to be able to do that. How wonderful it has been to give you the opportunity to just expand and to be able to research and to do and to, I'm sure, experiment to some degree, but to, mm-hmm. to really develop this robust service. I mean, that cannot be what everybody else is doing. Yeah. I mean, it's it's great. When I first started, you know, some of the first things I said was I really want to get massage started and I really want to get animal assisted therapy started. And so, you know, Jill Koss and Child Life really spearheaded the animal assisted therapy, but all the other complementary therapies that we've been able to develop have been really beneficial for the patients. And they just, they really, really appreciate it. That's wonderful. And I, honestly, I think that that's what I love about Cook is that it's full of passionate people. And if you have a good idea that's going to benefit children, well, you can find support for what you want to do. And so I just, it's just so nice to be part of an organization that wants to help kids get better and supports passionate people, you know, who share the same ideals. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Dr. Gandhi, thank you so much for being a part of this. And thank you for what you're doing for our kids and the kids in our community. I mean, this is so helpful um, because I know that there's a lot of anxiety with parents when something happens to a child and they are in discomfort, they are in pain, and they want to make sure that their kids are comfortable. But having all of this is, is just, I'm sure, really, really comforting to the parents. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us for this episode of Raising Joy. You can find more information about Cook Children's Joy campaign on CheckupNewsroom.com. And if you need help for yourself or your child, please reach out to a professional in your area. Their pediatrician or doctor are a great resource. And to our listeners, please rate, review, and subscribe to Raising Joy. Until next time, have have a a joyful joyful day. day.